Everyone, thanks for listening. Um, I'm talking with Sadia Hamid again. Sadia is a spokesperson for the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, and she's also done a lot of work for women's rights and in um, like the women's arena or women's rights advocacy arena. Hi, Sadia. Thank you for coming back on. And you wanted to speak about something specific, so I'm going to let you take the lead and we can go from there. Hi, Abed. It's really nice to be on again. Um, yeah, so... Um I guess there's a little bit of a preamble that's needed in some ways. So, um, or, although I work for the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, this isn't like a CEMB opinion. This is just a Sadia opinion, really. Um, and this is this is something very separate from that kind of work. But in some ways, it does end up getting sewn into the work that we do um, because it it feeds into the whole identity politics sort of. Um, you know, mindset and the hysteria around identity politics, but it is definitely a separate opinion uh, of mine. Um, and actually, there was um, there was a moment recently where uh, I really, really got to find out, you know, who's who's the goodie and who's the baddie in this movement. Because whenever you you kind of in any kind of movement around identity politics, there's always some people who are doing it for the right reasons and some people who are doing it for the wrong reasons. And we know that when we talk about our our issues around Islam as well. You know, there's some people who genuinely have concerns around issues around Islam and then there's some people who just really hate anybody from a different background from themselves um, and a very tribal. Um, uh, so, so there was a moment recently um, uh, with the trans movement and the trans issues that we talk about where that happened. And that, that moment for me was um, the, the, the protests outside some schools in the UK. So there's been protests outside um, a couple of primary schools down the road from me in Birmingham. Um, where uh, Muslim fundamentalist parents and some Muslim fundamentalists that aren't parents have decided to jump on this bandwagon and lead the protests, are protesting outside the school um, because the schools have t uh, are teaching children about inclusivity and the Equalities Act. So the Equalities Act it were, uh, of 2010 um, it basically is what it says on the tin. It's designed for any minority and to ensure that every minority's rights are protected. So that's women, uh, marriage equality, um, uh, you know, um, uh, homosexuality, uh, race, uh, religion, all of the strands are kind of covered in that. So they created a, um, a, a teaching package based on that. Then we had some parents protesting outside the school saying, you can't teach our children about um, homosexuality because you're going to turn our kids gay. Uh, and we are going to continue protesting outside the school um, until this stops. And some of the schools have to, you know, full respect to them, they've carried on, they've not given in to these fundamentalists. And actually, for us right now, somebody put it wonderfully to me the other day, somebody said, this is the the Rushdie affair of today. And I genuinely feel like that's the most perfect way of putting it, because it is, you know, right now we're picking sides. A lot of people have sided with the protesters, including some very, very influential politicians have come out in support of the protesters saying, yes, you're right. Um, but to my horror, some of my feminist friends sided with the protesters on this one, saying that uh, we don't want our kids being taught about trans ideology. And largely, I would have agreed with them on uh, in relation to some of the, their arguments around the whole trans issue. However, I don't. Uh, I think that kids have a right to learn about everything. Um, I don't think that they're going to all of a sudden be turned trans by being taught about trans equality. So that was really, really key for me. Um, so, with that preamble over which is quite a long preamble I do apologize for that no, no worries um, I do have to say that I am concerned by the trans movement um, as it stands today so I, I do feel like the trans movement works against both women's 
and the gay rights movement. Um, so the trans argument is that uh, an effeminate young boy uh, may not grow into a gay man and rather he needs surgical intervention to become a woman. So, um, so yeah, so all the a tomboy girl won't simply just grow into like a happy, healthy lesbian, rather that she needs to have skin grafted from her arm in an attempt to create some sort of a penis. Um, and this is rightfully unsettling for a lot of gay men and lesbian women um, and it's really undermining to the um, uh, lesbian and gay movement um, so that's a br like you know we've briefly touched on the impact of the trans movement on gay people but for women as well um, we've been fighting really hard for equality and equal rights but also against like stereotypes of what it is to be a woman you know that we should be wearing tiny mini skirts and we should be talking a certain way and behaving a certain way and eating a certain way and all of these stereotypes that are imposed on us by men we fought really really hard from that and we're barely there yet you know those stereotypes are still imposed on us I mean in our community for example you know we, I, I remember being told not to laugh too loudly, um, you know, that I should sit uh, with my legs a certain way, you know, all of these things are still imposed on our women in particular, but generally as well, those stereotypes still exist and they're still imposed. And then along come some trans male to females who behave, dress and look like caricatures of what women are expected to be. Um, and that's very offensive to women and the years of struggle that we've, you know, the struggles that we've endured and the fights that we have been, we, that we've been fighting, these, they're, they're like, they're stereotypes of what men say that women are. Um, and they, we're being dragged back to these stereotypes and it is offensive. It's very, very offensive to drag us back to those stereotypes. That's not what women are. Um, you know, I've seen some trans male to females that dress like porn stars. That's not what it means to be a woman. You know, like that's not all that we are. Um, or for example, there's a, there's a local counselor in my area that thinks that to be a woman is to knit whilst they're on the bus, you know. When was the last time you saw that? When we don't go around knitting or baking or, you know, um, making ourselves up uh, in that way. That's not, that's not what we're about. So these stereotypes are being imposed back on us. But what I actually see this trans movement as is misogyny in drag, um, and there's two things that come to mind that evidence this. So one is this, this discussion around the cotton ceiling, where in the trans movement, male to females are accusing lesbians that refuse to have sex with them of transphobia. Now, we have so, saw something similar to this. Recently, there were two lesbian women who refused to kiss on a bus and then were beaten the crap out of. It just a matter of days ago in London, uh, I think it was in London. Yeah. Um, now, pop a dress on those young lads, and it's perfectly acceptable, is it? Because that's what we're talking about. Uh, the same of this, uh, the emergence of this disgusting statement. I've heard trans male to female say things like, choke on my lady dick. Now, if a man had told me to choke on his dick, that would be plain old rapey misogyny. Pop a dress on him and it's acceptable. Okay. That's where we are. So this movement isn't taking us, this isn't pro progress, this is regression. We're going backwards. But at the expense of both women's rights and gay rights. Right. I mean, there's like, there's an awful lot there. I want to take, I, I, I want to step away from the, the protest at the Birmingham thing because there's, I, I, they're they're interrelated, but I think there's a lot of um, they're just too much to go, and we can come back to that. But okay, like what you were talking yeah. about, the you have to dress okay, or they're dressing very feminine and all that. I 
I go back to like one that's really famous is Bruce Jenner to Caitlyn Jenner, right? Yes. And so when Bruce became Caitlyn and did the big reveal and all that, mm. I mean, that was one of the things that they focused on was, yeah. look how glamorous she is, look how beautiful she is, you know, all that. Now, yeah, and that was one of my first things, like, I'm, okay, I thought we weren't supposed to be objectifying. I thought we weren't supposed to be, you know. Yes. And okay. And that being said, I, I mean, I just Joe's laid this straight out. It was like a you know, a straight man. Like, you see a picture of a pretty girl. Yeah, okay, that's a picture of a pretty girl. Like, a, you, know, everyone does some some form of objectifying at one point or other. Yes. But if we want to get past that, yeah. Then, and, and then okay. Whatever. I mean, even on the other side of this, they they made, you know, Caitlyn Jenner was Glamour Woman of the Year, and Caitlyn Jenner hadn't even been a woman for six months. Yes. I I don't understand. Like 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 I said, those are the things to me that I I, I don't get. And yeah. then, you know, at the same time, that rapper uh, Zuby Zubby, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. He said, yeah. okay, I'm a woman. I'm going to enter as a woman power lifter and broke the woman's power lifting record. Yeah. Didn't change any physical appearance. To, and I'm not saying you have to. I'm not saying if you want to say you're a woman or whatever. You know, like a lot of this should be about choice. I, I, I disagree though. I actually think you have to. I'm sorry. I think it's really offensive to me because... Um, like the fact that uh, it it came across, Zuby came across as it, like a bull in a china shop. Like I'm going to do this. What are you women going to do? That's how it came across. Um, I, 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 and I, it's this this erasure of women by men that I'm finding really really offensive now. And we're still not done you know fighting for women's equality particularly in our parts of the world that's not we're not even there yet and then we have men coming in you know forcing women out of their own spaces their own movements i don't think that's acceptable i think it's it, it feels like a bullyingish type type tactic and like zuby in that post that he put on twitter even said um uh you know i uh, um one, I'm going to do it without trying out, and B, don't be offensive, like don't uh, don't be a bigger or something. That's how he ended it. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to use bullying tactics, but don't bully me back. It just sounded like the schoolboy bully. Well, I bully because I've been bullied, so don't be a bully back. Okay. Like, but just I, uh, okay. In defense of him, sorry, he did, or I don't know if I should say him or I. Okay, but when he went into the powerlifting thing. He did it to prove a point saying it's yeah. wrong that someone who says they've transitioned into, you know, was a man and then transitioned into a woman, it's wrong for them to now go into women's sports. I mean, that's what, from my understanding, that's why he did it, right? Yes. So he was using the rhetoric, and I, you know, whatever you call it, rhetoric, I mean, like, you know, he was using the the yeah. speaking points from the trans movement. Yeah, yeah. So, so I re I realized that, but it didn't help in any way, shape, or form. In fact, all it did was further empower that kind of person to do it again and to do it b bigger and better. Because look, he can do it. So, he, like in some ways, I, I realized that it was supposed to be satirical and sort of help in some way, but I, it didn't at all. Um, it just reinforced some of uh, those those behaviors that already exist in others um and in terms of sport i mean like it shouldn't even be entertained uh, like I, I find it quite offensive that um women are being forced out of sports by by men yeah i mean okay the, the sports thing i the, the i i don't think uh that it'll it's such an obvious you know, advantage and people say, oh, well, there's, you know, uh, there's, okay, there's an MMA fighter uh, and uh, went by, then like went by the name of Fallon Fox and then, yeah. you know, it, it was a male transitioned to a woman, 
but then would go into the ring and just beat the shit out of women. And Ronda, yeah. Ronda Rousey, who is arguably one of the best women's MMA fighters, refused to yes. fu- refused to fight Fallon Fox. Okay. And Fallon Fox lost once to one woman. Everyone's saying, "See, it's 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 fair because a woman can beat him." It's like, yeah, you know, or beat her. I mean, like I said again, these little slips is is, is my slip of the tongue right there. Should I, you know, am I a hateful person now? Am I a transphobe? Um, I bet there's been instances where somebody's accidentally called me a man or I've accidentally called a man a woman that that isn't, you know, um, transitioning or like uh, uh, identifies as the opposite sex. It's like that's never been a problem. Now there's this hysteria around it. And I think, well, if that's the, the, the like, if that's all you have if that's all of your problems, then actually, mate, you've got it pretty easy, you know? Yeah. Okay, and there, let's, you know, the I, certain things, you know, about problems or whatever. Like, we have, there's this group out of the, the southern state somewhere, um, and they're calling for, uh, on the anniversary of the Pulse shooting, they want to do a, a thing called Make America Straight Again, right? <laughs> Now, <laughs> what does that even mean? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know, but okay. And they're actually calling for violence. I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but they're also. I think they might be calling for killing. Um, you know, but they're calling for a lot of hateful things, and it's, you know, that's a reaction on one side, and then, yeah, you know, and that's acceptable. Yeah, you know, no, like- not ex- yeah, but we, I, but what I, I, what I hate to see is. Like, and I think this is where you're coming from. And forgive me if I'm putting words in your mouth. The cause might be admirable, right? Mm. But the arguments you have for it are bad, and I can't get behind the arguments. Like, you know, we need to fix uh, misogyny in Islam. All right, then we'll, you know, ban all the verses from the the Quran and all the hadiths that. Uh, impose um you know subjugation of women you're not Mm. even allowed to talk about them i mean Mm. that's a bad argument of how to fix that problem right i couldn't get behind that argument it doesn't achieve anything it's Mm -hmm. important to remember where you've come from to prevent you going back there that's why it's important to to raise awareness about them and allow people to be able to critically challenge and you know understand like a proper understanding of those verses mm-hmm. is really, really crucial. Like, I'm not for banning any kind of literature or ideas or discussions or anything like that. The thing to be mindful of is when you talk about anything that's hateful or offensive or anything like that, there's going to be some people that listen to it, and then there's going to be some people that use it, uh, use it and abuse it for, for harming people. A, a good example of that currently is... Um, Joe Brand, there was a debacle with a comedian in yeah, the UK. I, I know all about yeah. that. Yeah, so about the battery acid. So uh, for those of you that don't know, a comedian said, you know, well, uh, there's no point in using milkshakes when there's battery acid um, for, to, to throw it like, you know, far right um, politicians. And actually, she's a comedian. She is going to say things like that get over it there's going to be some people that laugh at it there's going to be some people that find it distasteful and find it disgusting fair enough the people that then go and act on that have got some mental health issues that you know it wasn't a case of they sat waiting for somebody to go okay go and pour battery acid on somebody somebody who has that mindset is already you know that like that that's that's not the fault yeah. of the comedian. That's not the fault of the statement or the debate or the discussion. It, that means that that person who's carrying out the action has something wrong with them, and they you know, they're, they're, that's nobody else other than the person that carries out that action is to blame for that action. So we've got to stop, um, you know, tiptoeing around discussions, ideas, and worrying about the consequences of what we say are going to be, because otherwise we may as well all walk around silent, and then nothing changes, because then we're we're not discussing, um, you know, like I said just before, we have to be able to talk about our past uh, and our future to prevent harms. 
Um, yeah. It only causes further harm when we prevent discussion. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's, and that's what I was trying to get at with the, you know, the bad argument for the right cause. Yeah. Now, uh, there was a case that came up recently in the UK. It was, um, I think, it was the Hampstead Pools, where you had. Yeah. Now, I mean, to me, that's a perfect example of this. Now, you know, you had a a mixed gender pool, you had a male only pool, and you had a a female, um, a female only pool, from my understanding. Now, yeah. men to women, uh, so people who transitioned from male to female wanted to use the female pool, even though they had nothing overtly done or anything like that. And then yeah. when some female to male, like some people who transitioned from female to male tried to go in the male's men's pool, they were kicked out. Now, if you're going to mm-hmm. allow one, you have to allow the other. But... And again, therein is the like this argument, like okay, well, you're if you don't allow the trans women into the women's pool, you're denying mm-hmm. their existence. You're going to kill, and it's it's just like okay, let's take a step back and talk about those women in that pool who, for whatever reason, want to keep that a space only for biological women. And I think that's perfectly legitimate. Like you know the. Uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced it or not, but I was doing a debate in Cambridge uh, a couple of years ago now, and they had a unisex toilet. Um, And obviously, I've been into some unisex toilets before, but I had this experience there where this this guy that was quite creepy throughout the night, I bumped into him in the toilet, um, and he, he saw me and he went, oh, there you are. And he got really, really close and I had to navigate around him. Now, I don't want to do that when I'm going for a piss or even a shit. To be honest, I don't want that experience. I like being completely private when I go for a piss. And like, I like having just that space for women. You know, us girls sometimes talk about all kinds of things when we're alone in the bathroom. That is our space. Um, so there's some spaces that I think, like if we want them separate, absolutely fine but the, th- the thing as well I think is this has become a bit of an attention seeking um, uh, thing in my opinion like you have a, a males only pool a, a females only pool um, a mixed pool if it, like just use the mixed pool why do you have to create a scene why what is this thing that you're stirring up to you know to get some validation like I feel like it's it's uh, very um, like I can't like uh, these people these people that create these scenes are constantly looking for this this drama to hype up the hysteria when actually there's already a solution there. Just use the mix pool, you know, it, and it's fine, and nothing there's there's not going to be any problem. Um, I don't understand the the need to constantly create this drama and this hysteria. Yeah, and okay, on that, because I, I've heard the argument um, where, okay, you know, this has been going on for years and no one's yeah. ever really known about it. And it's like, yes, fine. You've yeah. got, you know, you were, you, you know, you were identifying as a woman, dressing as a woman, whatever, you're going into the woman's bathroom. No mm. one's known about it. No one's. No one's saying anything about that. It's the ones like there was one in Vancouver. Um, this this one woman, and I mean, uh, she like some of the tweets that were coming out. Um, and she was, you know, like she was saying, "Well, I'm a, tr- you know, I'm a trans woman. If I go into the washroom, and you know, can I go up to a twelve year old girl and ask them if they're on their period?" Can I help them why with their tampon? You, and why would you do I, I don't know, but I mean, she's asking these questions and it's, and then there was a, a, a woman who's been working, you know, on the feminist front and she called this person out. I think uh, Megan something or other got banned from Twitter completely. Uh, yeah. It, and it's just like, okay, but honestly, I've never been in a, okay, no, granted that that's not true when I was about seven years old. Um, I had to go to the washroom and the men's washroom was full. So my mom told me to go into the women's. So that's the one time I've been in the women's washroom. But you know, like, like I, I, I don't know if that's a common thing in a woman's washroom, but I don't think it would be. 
Like, no, I'm sorry. Not even women would go into a toilet, see a 12-year-old girl and go, have you come on your period? Do you want me to help you with a tampon? That's not a normal thing. This is what I mean. These weird fantasies that are coming out of some of the some of the fantasists within this movement. And I have to say, like you said, historically, the trans movement wasn't like this. And also, the trans movement, something else has happened in it as well, which I'll come back to in a minute. But, um, like, is it, you know, the trans... Uh, community existed for a very, very long time before without the, this kind of behavior. Now, this, this, uh, you know, that scenario, I've, I've never heard of a woman walking into a toilet, seeing a 12 year old girl and going, if you come on your period, do you want help with me putting on a, ta putting in, in a tampon? If somebody's thinking like that, I think there's something immediately I think there's something wrong with them what where where is your mind going to and why is it going that far you know and to, to be honest if a 12 year old girl has just come on her period and she's out the likelihood is she's going to ask someone she trusts she is going to go to them she's not going to go to a complete stranger that you know why would she why would she? You don't have the confidence at that age to do stuff like that. But I mean, I don't even know why I'm having this conversation because that isn't a scenario that would ever happen. Yeah, I it's know, but but it's strangest thing to comfort, you know. But people were coming to her defense, uh, and then you know, like I said, this this uh, this, this feminist activist, uh, Megan something or other. She, yeah. you know, she called her out. She got attacked. And it's, and it's, but the, the whole point, the whole debate around it was, why are you denying her right to exist? And it's like, it's no, we're, 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 you know. Someone has denied your right to exist. Someone has denied your right, which you do not have, to go up to a 12-year-old girl and ask her if she's on her period. That's a weird thing to do. And then ask her if you can help her put in a fucking tampon. Nobody. She, she shouldn't. Uh, it, it, that's just not normal behavior that is absolutely not normal behavior it sounds creepy it sounds weird and it sounds like you have something wrong with you if you're thinking that far like it just it that is abs this is what i mean though like this this movement as it stands and i genuinely feel like the historic trans movement compared to what it is today were two very very different things absolutely i sympathize with the historic trans movement and the people the people in the trans community that are genuinely you know um like going through everything that's a whole different kettle of fish and a whole different discussion but this kind of thing th this um this weird fantasist sort of movement within this community it, it worries me a great deal and I find it creepy because if somebody if that was my daughter and I saw somebody doing that I would have broken their limbs I would have become incredibly angry straight away because that to me it would make me feel like my child is at risk straight away why are you even thinking about my daughter's period and then asking her if you can help her with her her tampon absolutely fucking not okay when there's something you brought up there, like the this trans movement or the the current iteration of it, yes, I think there's that's in a lot of um, social justice movements. Yes. I mean, you have social justice, you know, small s, small j, and then you have the capitals. And I think the ones with the capitals are the ones that are that have lost the plot. It's uh, yeah. I, it's this stuff that's coming out of academia where you're training kids to be activists you're not actually training them to think um you know this intersectionality where uh you know it's not only like if you're a woman if you're a white woman make give give your space up to a woman of color if you're you know, a south asian woman you're slightly more privileged than a uh, you know a, a black woman so give the black woman more space it's it's this insanity that's coming it's in. oppression Olympics. It's all. It, it's this oppression Olympics. It's really quite vulgar because actually, then you're not, you know, striving for, uh, just striving to level the playing field for everybody and bring everybody. Yeah, and I mean, okay. Into the same 
But I mean, also look at like the what you were you had mentioned before. If a a lesbian doesn't find uh, a trans woman attractive because the trans woman has a penis, all of a sudden yeah. the lesbian is you know committing a hate crime. But it's the same thing, you know, if a guy doesn't want to sleep with a woman who is, uh, you know, who, you know, it's someone who's transitioned to a woman but still has a penis. Like, no, I, I'm sorry, but that doesn't, I don't find that attractive. And then yet they're, you know. Bigger, everybody is entitled to have a taste, right? Yeah, but, but they're also talking about, okay, well, you can be taught to like it or how you should train yourself to like it. It's like, it's like conversion therapy in a way. But it's not just that. It, it sounds very rapey. Where well, you can be forced to like, fall in love with your rapist. Would you then? You know, this is this, uh, this the the only other similarity here is when women in our parts of the world, after being raped, to for the men to avoid prosecution, they are made to rape them. Well, it's all right. Eventually, you can fall in love with your rapist too, right? And he'll carry on raping you until you fall in love with him and develop Stockholm syndrome. What utter fucking bollocks! This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever. Heard heard that you can gradually fall in love with somebody no that's abuse we're just talking there's i mean like we can we can somersault around it however we like this is this is abuse um so no absolutely not and it it's just a fact of life sometimes you find people attractive sometimes you don't you can't push people into being attracted to you but remove remove the dress this is why this is why i keep talking about how this is misogyny and drag remove the dress and it's just a man bullying a woman into having sex with her, which is rape, right? Yeah, this but, is rapey behavior. Uh, yeah, and it's but it's also, it, you know, it's if you remove the dress as well, and like because like I said, it's it's also being you know straight men who say the same thing are being told that you know we're horrible human beings and you know we're hateful <laughs> and whatever. But it's the same thing. It's like okay, well, no, you're now forced. You're forcing me to be attracted to something I'm not attracted to. And it's, you know, how is, the, but it's, it's being done in the, like all this is being done in the name of progress. I, I, I hate how they, you know, they call themselves progressive. I'm, I'm sorry, but the only thing you're progressing towards is authoritarianism yeah, in my yeah. mind. And, yeah. you know, and, and actually, we don't have any progressive, um, I don't think we have any progress, progressive politics um, truly progressive politics in the mainstream at the moment. We like, uh, I think I've said it before. We are kind of the oddities because we're challenging these ridiculous mindsets, these ridiculous ideologies. Uh, you know, we are so catastrophically wrong about this right now. Yeah, so I, 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 I think that's that's the general discourse. Though we're catastrophically wrong about so much. And it's, it's, um, okay, I just finished this book. Uh, it's called um, Kindly Inquisitors by Jonathan Rauch, or Rauch, mm -hmm. I can't pronounce his name. But it, it goes back and it talks about uh, bringing creationism into schools in the States, the, you know, the, the Salman Rushdie affair. But it was wow. all about different threats to liberal science, which, what he called liberal science, but I mean, you know, it was basically the, 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 you know, an empiricist method, right? Like, you show me the evidence, yeah. and you go looking for falsifiability, not, you know, you don't verify things, you falsify them, try to prove them wrong in as many ways as possible, yeah. and take on yeah. all coming. And and he was talking about certain things, and he one of the threats, he, he, called, he called it the, you know, he said there's an authoritarian threat, like a fundamentalist threat, and then there's a humanitarian threat. And the humanitarian threat... And he's, he's bringing cases up for, like, he wrote the book and majority of it was written in the late 80s, you know, written about stuff in the late 80s and the early 90s. And it was, you know, a university saying, well, we will, we don't want to have, um, uh, we're going to ban speech that, you know, might offend people. And it's, and it, it's, it's going on now as well. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I remember this, but, and I used to laugh and I was joking about it and I was like, it was just, it was around, it was somewhere between 87 and 89. I don't have, remember the exact year, but they wanted to come out with a term, um, a gender neutral term for waiter and waitress. And it's now they use server, but at that point they were you going with some word and they wanted to call it waitron. So this, this, this 
unfeeling, like this cold, absolutely cold, sterile word that means nothing. Yeah. And but because we want to protect, you know, the, the, we we don't want to gender things. It's like it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous. But it's getting worse. This is getting worse. You know, now you you can't call um, uh, like we can't talk about women and periods. We have to call them menstruators. We can't talk about women menstruate. You know, uh, women menstruating. We have to say menstruators because men fucking menstruate too. We can't say pregnant women. We have to say pregnant people. Yeah, I'm sorry, I... men don't have babies it's as simple as that and i don't care if i get sent to the fucking you know chopping block to it i don't care men don't have babies men don't have periods get the fuck over it if you've got a penis you ain't having a baby deal with it okay and and if you've had the surgery as well and you've you know surgically transitioned into a woman you're still not having a baby no you know if you were bigotry facts aren't bigoted it's just and and okay and i know i said i might play devil's advocate here but it's like for i'm trying to think of a defense and it's i honestly can't and maybe i should have someone on afterwards to you know give me a defense (laughs) of it but it's I, i don't see how you can say that like i i again getting back to that like uh rauch's book um and it's it's, but it's the same argument that's been had over and over and over again. It's it's the same argument that Milton put out. It's the same argument that Mill put out. You know, and Payne and Voltaire. It's like you need to be able to defend your side against the best argument from the other side. And if you can't do it, then maybe your argument is wrong. Now yeah. you have to, and it's, but as as soon as you bring up this topic, you. Know, it's 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 you're not even allowed to have the debate it's i mean it's something completely there's a hysteria yeah. there. there's an absolute hysteria uh-uh. but the problem is this is happening at the expense of women like that's what i uh, you know i genuinely feel, genuinely feel like that so uh, one at the expense of um gay people both lesbians and gay men you know like this is perfect for the most conservative religious fundamentalists as well we mustn't forget that the highest number of sex changes in the world happen in iran yeah and i what was it it was a pink news who said that it was iran was so progressive about that and it's like you do realize that that you know they have those surgeries and it's the highest number because they give them give gay men and lesbians the option of having the surgery or being killed yeah exactly (laughs) Exactly. This is happening at the expense of us. It's not happening because this is progress. So, And the other thing also, I, I don't know if you remember, Pakistan had a pride last year. It wasn't really a pride. You couldn't call it a gay pride. It was a trans pride. So in Pakistan, the trans community is, uh, from, from a very young age, if you have a child that is, um, we call them the hijra community, um, uh, but also known as the trans community. It's kind of a bit more compli- complicated, though. Um, like, if your child um, is a hermaphrodite or is intersex or, um, you know, is, um, a, is uh, you know, quite effeminate as a boy, um, the hijra community will come and take them away. So, but but they, they're allowed to dance uh, publicly, they they're expected to dance. Actually, if there's like a celebration, they're brought in, they're wheeled out to kind of do the dance, and then they're given money. They're not allowed proper jobs or anything like that. But they had a trans pride. Now the trans community is very, very, very visible in Pakistan. Compare that to the LGB community that is invisible. The 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 pride that they had last year was only for the trans community not for the lgb community now that was celebrated around the world around much of the western world i'd like to say actually in the anglosphere that don't really understand the politics around lgbt issues in our countries um as like progress in pakistan nothing progressive about it because i spoke to actually some um gay and lesbian friends out there and i said oh did you go and they were like no that would have been suicide making ourselves visible like that they're already visible you know there would have been no backlash against the trans community of pakistan because that's 
you know, it's perfectly acceptable for them to dance and sing and, you know, have that celebration. But if if the LGB community was to join that procession, they would have been murdered on the spot. So there was nothing progressive about that. And largely, much of the world didn't really understand, much of the Anglosphere didn't really understand the, the, the issues um, that they were facing. And they celebrated it as a big win. And it was, it was far from that. But that's what it, it does sort of link in because this erasure of um, LGB people around the world through this, the, the trans movement manifests slightly differently in all parts of the world, but it is very much there, you know, in Iran, by forcing them to have sex change, in Pakistan, by pushing forward the trans um, pride as progress for LGBT people, and in reality, it's just for T people, in the UK, by from a very young age, convincing them that they should be, you know, a different sex, that they're born into the wrong body, and changing, changing their their sex as adults so that we have less homosexuals in the country it's there, there there is an international perspective and it manifests slightly differently in each country but it is there the erasure of uh, gay people is very very much a reality through this trans movement um yeah yeah okay i mean the the hijra thing i mean i i, I don't know about it in pakistan so much because i i was i've only been to pakistan twice in my life in yeah. You know, once was for 12 hours because of a screw up with the flight so I don't think yeah. that counts but um, like in Hyderabad that's where I grew up at Hyderabad in India that's where I was born yeah. that's where my family you know going back you would hear it'd be at least in my family they were like the hijra hijra community were accepted yeah but that's what they weren't you know they weren't they were they were you shouldn't even say accepted or tolerated and it was okay, yes. necessary evil. And they would talk about, you know, whenever someone was born, oh, they would pay off someone in the hospital to get the information. They would go to the person's house and dance around and and collect some money and whatever. But like you said, they 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 didn't work. That's how they you know got money mm -hmm. was by doing these kind of things. And they were looked down upon. And you know, coming to, when we moved to Canada, I mean, I you know, I would hear my parents and and. and they gradually evolved the longer or their thinking evolved the longer we were in Canada. But when we first got here, you know, mm. see, seeing anything remotely connected to gay or lesbian, um, yeah. it, it was shunned and frowned upon. I mean, I, I remember my dad, like, even if, if we were watching TV and something, and it was in the seventies. So some of this stuff was starting to come up on, you know, the sitcoms and things like that. He would right away, like go up and change a channel. So, you know, kids don't get exposed to it. And so there is a huge stigma there, but, but it's, it's also here. Like, I mean, um, okay. I, I'm trying to remember the school now and I'm going to, for the life of me, I can't remember the school, but it was, so it was a diversity council of some university, right? Um, and it was a well-known university. I just can't remember the name. The person who was the president was then running again for re-election while she was running for re-election, she transitioned into a man. And because she transitioned into a man, she was now a white male. She was no longer diverse enough to be di diversity <laughs> president of the diversity council. I mean, I, I'm not... You, you, it, it's lampooning itself. I'm sorry, but come on. <laughs> I mean, it sounds crazy, right? It sounds crazy. This the was fact a, that we... Still counting these privilege points, though. I mean, we're still doing that. It's 2019, and we haven't moved away from you know some people are better than others. Da 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 da. That that kind of political way of thinking means that we haven't actually progressed um, as humanity. I'd I'd expected. I, I really expected in my lifetime to have moved to a position of, well, if you're human, you're, you know, we're all going to treat everybody fairly and equally, and then we're going to learn to treat animals slightly better. And we haven't yeah. actually got that far, let alone, you know, yeah. treating animals better or treating the planet yeah. better. Yeah, yeah, but okay, and this is going back again, I think to about 2015 or 16, um, it was in the UK, it, the president of the students associate like the association of students associations i'm not sure what it's called there he mm. was being interviewed and i could if i could find it on youtube I'll, I'll put it in the description but you know oh well 
he actually said some people are more equal than others. The, the little the quote from Animal Farm. I mean, he just went out and said it. And it's like some people, but I think he said some people are more privileged than others, and or something along those lines. And he was he, he had this smug look on his face, like he'd made some brilliant point. And it's like, come on, like yeah, it's like you're actually using Animal Farm to defend yourself, really? Yeah. You know, uh, and I, I mean that's what I don't get. Like it's you know this this thing whiteness. Which, which, I mean, like, again, this the intersectionality, this, this, you know, the, the, what they're, what a few people here are calling grievance studies. And it's just, and to me, that's a perfect thing because that's all it's about is grievances. You know? Yeah. And then I, I heard, I read something the other day about some other nests, like, you know, instead of whiteness, it was something else. And it's just like, you know, it, it permeates everything. It's, it's like, it's like original sin. Um, it, it, it's, okay, if you, and I only know about this. I only started reading about it recently, so I, I shouldn't maybe even bring it up. But, but in uh, Calvinism, they have this thing called total depravity, which the whole system in itself is depraved. You are continuously surrounded by sin. It will it's consumed the whole and that and that's what they're saying. Whiteness is, and there's like yo, uh, you know maybe there's a maleness or whatever or patriarchalness. I have no idea that's stopping the trans issue or something. But it's it's like. When, when you start ethnicizing politics, then you're on dangerous ground. You know, politics isn't there to be ethnicized because that, that creates huge chasms in in societies and countries. You know, like there's, there's some things that we all, all suffer. You know, poverty, for instance, in this country, if we were, if we were to go back to the UK, um, like if you're, if you're, uh, a worker, or if you're a non-worker, both of those people, the both working class people, as workers and non-workers, at the end of their 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 month, all of their income after they've paid for everything, they've got nothing left over. When they've paid their rent, bills, bought their food, some people can't even afford food. Um, they're left with nothing. That is a real political issue. Well, the color of their skin. Has got nothing to do with it. Yeah, and it's. I mean, I. I mean, I think it, we're really straying a little bit field, but I think it's. This is all kind of, and I. This is what I hate the most about it. I'm losing words. I was going to say this is all kind of interconnected, and it's just like, oh my god, I'm bringing intersectionality. And it's just like, no, I'm not. But I mean, like you said, it's it's not the color of your skin. It's not where you, you know they they wanted to do a thing for the SATs in the U.S. And I don't know 100 percent about this, and I've I've heard all kinds of different sides, but. I should maybe look into it more, but it was, um, they want to start using, uh, not just your raw SAT scores, but your social class and where you live to help, uh, you know, so if they're going to wait, if they're going to give, uh, you know, black people an extra hundred points on the SAT scores and they're going to deduct them from Asians, instead of doing that, they're going to do it on who lives in poor neighborhoods. But they're making this, you know, very easy to exploit because yeah. you can just get yourself uh, an address in a poor neighborhood and, you know, be living in Beverly Hills or whatever, right? And So go. rather than give, educating everybody to bring them up all to the same level and give them, like, give everyone better education, what was they're going to, was they're going to... Uh, it, you know, deduct points and and play around, play around with numbers. Yeah. Like, just give everybody a fair a fair chance. Yeah. You know, uh, like intersectionality has been a big, big, huge failure. You know, when I first read uh, Crenshaw's paper, I thought it was fantastic. Kimberly Crenshaw was sort of the architect yeah. of intersectionality. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it made sense, um, but I didn't think it was going to be used in the way that it's used today. Um, and the way it's used today, um, it's just been toxic. I can't stand the term intersectionality anymore. Um, it just makes me sick. Yeah, but that's okay. But again, a lot of these things, uh, you know, aren't you against racism? Yeah, I'm against (laughs) racism, but critical race theory from the little I know of it, and I'm I'm starting to look more into it Mm. is insane. And it's the same thing, like, you know, this intersectionality. Yes, 
if you want to discuss certain issues and there are people who will have, you know, insights into certain issues that we should listen to, but policy should not be derived from those insights. Those insights should help formulate some sort of policy or help the discussion around policy. And, but it's not like, you know, you're not looking for that one person who's, you know, like the, the, the people make a joke with the unicorn, like it's the, the, you know, the bisexual handicapped, you know, uh, bi, <laughs> biracial, uh, transgender woman who, I mean, like, no, you're not going to find that. And it's like, and by, by virtue of all that, that person doesn't have the last say. The person yeah. who should have the last say is the person who gives you the best argument. And again, these arguments have to be, you can re-debate them, you can, but bring good arguments against them. It's just like, oh, yo, you're, you're denying my existence when you speak out against me or when you ask a question. Exactly yeah. that. It's really hard because this intersectional <clears throat> movement, all it's been doing is systematically shutting down any discussion and debate mm-hmm. that doesn't agree with it. You know, I, I experienced that recently. One of my colleagues got in touch with me um, three or four months ago now uh, after I done, I did it like a TV appearance and somebody looked me up on my Twitter and said, and rather than contacting me, because obviously, you know, it, I'm too scary to speak to by myself, um, he went and contacted one of my colleagues who then decided to contact me and say, um, uh, somebody has just contacted me to say CMB really shouldn't be associating with you because you're a transphobe. And I was like, well, who the fuck is, are they? Why the fuck haven't they had the courage to speak to me the, myself? It was a male uh, like trans activist douche, as far as I'm aware, contacting a male employee of, uh, of ours a male a colleague of mine. So what the fuck is this? They can't talk to the women themselves to start off with. But also, I hadn't actually even said anything controversial yet. That was one of my least controversial mm-hmm. tweets that he had jumped on. Um, so um, it, they, they, they're they constantly trying to shut down any discussion around this. And actually, the trans lobby and the Islamist lobby uh, the Muslim fundamentalist lobby, I should say, behave in exactly the same way. They contact your employer. They try and h- hype up hysteria about one thing that you said that they disagree with. They never talk to you directly. They always go and talk to people behind your back and try and create this hysteria around you, this unthinking, you know, um, hysteria around, well, we're the victims, but we're going to act like the perpetrators and then carry on pretending to be victims when actually nothing has happened to us from a mere fucking discussion. Yeah, and I mean, also the, the, this, when it comes to things like Islam or race or whatever, a lot of these people, and I was joking with someone about this the other day, but it's, I used to call it uh, victimhood appropriation because most of the people who are, are speaking out about this are these you know, upper middle class and again, like I'm bringing identity into this, and I'm trying to talk about like not bringing. Identity, but it's but if you look at the majority of the people who are freaking out about all this intersectionality and this identity politics and this identity as, are, are people who are feeling aggrieved and victimized on someone else's behalf. And I used to jokingly say yeah. they're they're appropriating victimhood, but it's then true. but then the other day I but the other day I said no, you know what? They're not appropriating it; they're gentrifying it. They're actually gentrifying victimhood. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Now, it's really, really important. So class is one thing that's really very, very important. That is a very important one to focus on. And I can promise you, not a single fucking social justice warrior has ever discussed class and ever lived the reality of the actual working class of any of our countries. So that's one thing. The other thing is, yes, uh, a few days ago, I was driving past, um, I was dri- uh, uh, driving down the road, um, and at a bus stop, I saw a woman. She had um, like a bruised face. And she couldn't stop herself from crying. I was in my car, otherwise I would have spoken to her. And she was giving her uh, her baby a bottle of milk. And I was thinking to myself, do you know what? That woman isn't going to give a shit about trans politics. She's not going to give a shit about feminism. She's not going to give a shit about socialism. She is just surviving that's all she's doing and I can promise you every single one of those social social justice warrior douchebags isn't even 
thinking about her. They, they don't think about real problems. They don't even know about real problems. They don't care about people's real problems. They only care about having these discussions about shit that doesn't have anything to do with them, about battles that are already, like, you know, they're not fighting things that are actually real or important or that matter. Those poor people that are on the front lines very much of trying to just the daily bump and grind of survival, they're invisible to them. They would walk past them and not even see them in their hipster fucking jeans. <laughs> yeah, and, and but also, I mean, you know, the... <sighs> Like this, this idea that a homeless white guy has yeah. some privilege that you know a person of color who's a professional, you know, a lawyer, doctor, engineer, whatever, you know, the homeless white guy has some privilege over and above them. I'm like, come on, give me a break. Yeah, you know, there, there, there is no privilege that these people have, and it's. I mean, no, it's, there was. There was a there was a trans model, wasn't there, in um, the UK? Uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, Bergoff. Or, uh, yeah. Bergoff. Yeah. yeah, she tried to claim, but well, she made this disgusting statement that all white people are disgusting and all white people are racists, ma- claiming that, like, making out that she was somehow underprivileged when she was a L'Oreal model earning quite a packet, you know, and. What she's going to stand in front of a white homeless guy and pretend that she's got it harder? I would have pissed on her if I was that homeless man, to be quite frank. Yeah, and, but it's. I mean, everyone wants. Okay, I shouldn't say everyone, but the average person you know out there would like to see everyone live a decent, happy life, and you can yeah. do what you want to help, but. They're turning. You're getting people. You're turning people off from trying to do the right thing. And again, this I think goes back to what I was saying was, you know, the the bad argument, the wrong argument for a good cause is going to hurt yeah. that cause so much because you're going to turn yeah. people off. And it's you know, the and you know I'm bringing up stuff that like, I just keep saying I haven't looked that much into it and I should but just off the face of it um, so the what's going on in the US at the southern border all these people coming in and wanting to come in illegally now, you know just yeah. me saying illegally is going to freak people oh, how can you say that they're looking for a better life but yes they're not going through the process so the US military or the US government wants to use a base that at one point they used to inter Japanese citizens during World War II it's not used as an internment camp. It's not like it was a you know internment camp that was mothballed that they're reopening up now to throw kids into prison. It's an actual functioning military base. But you know you've got tens of thousands of people coming to the border. You want to let them in. You want to process them. You don't want to keep them on the other side of the border. You don't. You want to let them in and do what? Then just let them go run free. But they're just freaking out because oh my god they're putting these kids into concentration camps. It's like okay did you read past the headline? Did you look yeah. at anything else beyond it? You know, yeah. what do you want done with these children? Like, do you want to, okay, just come in and then let everyone go free and then there's no accountability, but then they need support. So where do they go to get that support? You know, like, it, it's just, it's it's like little kids. It's it's, it's Golding's Lord of the Flies, except instead yeah. of, it's trying to try to, you know, kill Piggy by beating him up, we're, we're pampering Piggy to death. We're, I shouldn't call it pampering, but you know, like, you're coddling these people to death and you're not giving them what they really need. You're giving them what they think they need. And I'm going to just rant you a little bit more here because I worked in Haiti after the earthquake. It was part of the Canadian government uh, yeah. relief package. And I've worked overseas in war zones. I've spoken with NGOs. And some of the these charities have such a despicable name and what the Canadian government was doing as well. And it... it Everything we did, like we build offices, we built all this stuff, and but we were dictated by the Canadian government, go do this, this is what they need. When we get there and we speak to the people, what they actually need is something completely different. You know, yeah. the basic idea is yes, what they need, but the, the internal workings of it were completely laid out wrong. And mm. that's what I find is happening in a lot of these places. It's in a lot of these causes, it's someone who out of 
wanting to do good or whatever, but just get, goes at it so wrongly and they don't speak to the people that they're trying to help because, oh, you know what? We know better than you keep. And these are the same people that keep talking about lived experience and, you know, you know, you can't take away well, what this person knows and, you know, but at the same time, they don't go and actually, you know, go into that neighborhood and speak. And then you might find that, yes, it's predominantly, you know, X, but you also have poor working class white people. You also have, you know, uh, if it's a South Asian community, you also have, uh, you know, East Asians and and black people and whatever. But like, just go and see what they need and instead of just some blanket policy that's not going to do anyone any good. Yeah, yeah. There's no thinking involved in it, is there? No. Just, well, we can guess and that's it. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's all... It, like, again, the, the, these things are. The, I'm sorry, I get frustrated because I'm trying to work this out, and it's just every day there's something new, and I'm trying to like get an understanding of it. But that's another thing; like, it changes so fast. Yeah. You know, and okay, my mom, she's in her seventies, mm-hmm. and she's gonna kill me for you know me me letting that out. But <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, but she's not on social media. She's not really in this sphere. If she sees something about this on the news, she's not going to know what to make of it. No, she goes by what she sees. And, and but I mean, you know, and if she makes a mistake, is someone going to freak out at her? Like, you know, she's taking transit and she says the wrong thing by mistake. Is someone just going to let loose on her because, you know, oh my God, you're a Racist, bigot, homophobe, transphobe, so whatever. Of it's ridiculous, exactly. But this is it. This is the point that I was going back to. We used to make these mistakes before, and nobody, it, you know, it wasn't considered a fucking crime. Now that it's considered a crime, it's created this environment where everybody is scared to say, you know, um, even accidentally say anything. And when you create an environment where everybody's walking on eggshells, that environment is constantly at boiling point. And at some point, that pressure cooker is just going to explode. Yeah. And uh, that's they're created. I mean, I don't know about the UK. I mean, I've heard about uh, journalists getting fired and things like that. And But yeah. in, in at least in Ontario, like one of the provinces of Canada, if a parent denies the child the right to transition... The state can take them away. And I'm talking about kids in primary school. That's ridiculous. And when I was a kid, because things were better for boys in our community, I wanted to be a boy. So yeah. what, they would have just they would have just done it. Like, you, that's ridiculous. At what, one point, I wanted to be white. And if, if my parents didn't let me, you know, because that's where we're heading. Kids now... They want to change their sex. We've got to do that straight away. We've got to appease them straight away. What about when kids say they want to change race? Because eventually we're going to have to start listening to that too, right? Yeah. And then, but okay, but then the, I mean, you also, you want to go into the really weeds of this stuff because it's, it's, some of it started like, you know, I uh, specious, like I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a cat or whatever. Um, and then the worst one right now, I keep hearing about ableism, and it's so scary. Yeah. Um, you know, and they, they had a conference in, in Ottawa a couple of years back, and they said, okay, you know, we only have, it was a very small number of cases that they officially had records for, but there were some unofficial ones. But, you know, the official cases, there were doctors who actually performed amputation on people because they, because they felt bad about not they felt bad about being able-bodied now i'm like what kind of doctor will do that i thought the first oath was do no harm yeah exactly you know again like i said these are this is an extreme case but when do you stop accepting exactly this is where it leads because it just eventually gets completely out of hand um i mean okay i I just want to interrupt for one second okay when i say where does this all lead i'm not talking about someone wanting to transition i'm not talking about someone wanting to be gay or anything like that i'm talking about when does us not being able to discuss these things when does it say you have to accept everything no matter what someone Mm. says without when are you know 
we have to be able to look at things critically. And if we can't, how far are we going to go at what we don't look critically? That's what I'm asking about. Like, when does this stop? Yeah. Yeah. It feels like it's never going to, sadly. It feels like it's just moving so quickly towards, well, we've just got to, uh, if somebody says, I want, we've got to, we've got to comply. Um, That's where we're headed. There's some slight, and, I, and I'm going to give this with a huge caveat, there's some slight indications that people are taking this less and less seriously, but the opposite is have- no, but the opposite is happening. We're getting an overcorrection. Like before, you know, we had this, the wokeness and everyone was woke. <laughs> but but now you're getting this stupid counter to it. Um, you know, I'm red-pilled. And these people are just as um, divisive. They're just as reactionary. They're they're just as dogmatic. But it's just, yeah. it, it, it's, it's just some other bullshit, right? It's another way of, okay, we, we shut down speech in this way and this for, the, for the, you know, these 10 years. Now for the next 10 years, we're going to shut down speech in this other way. I mean, look at someone like Candace. I don't understand. What is this on Red Pill? I, I actually don't understand. Okay. Red Pill, okay, you know the movie The Matrix? If you took the Red Pill, you'd wake yeah. up, right? Okay, yeah. so all these people who were woke and then all of a sudden realizing that, oh my God, this is wrong and they become Red Pill and they've woken up to the dangers of being woke. Right, so um, I don't know if you know Candace Owens. If you don't, check her out. Um, uh, she's insane. Um, okay, now who is she? Uh, she's running this. She's kind of leading this movement called Blexit, which is the black exit from the Democratic Party. Um, just recently, when there was the the bill in Alabama passed about the abortions, where you know the the you could imprison the mother for having an abortion and blah blah she said that the reason the democratic party is behind is in support of abortions is the democratic party wants to have a black genocide because of x percentage of abortions happen in black communities as opposed to the white communities it's just just nuts okay she's racializing she, abortion yeah and she's a black woman who has you know she was very social justicey and then she got in trouble because she said the wrong thing. And then she got a dog piled on and Breitbart came to her aid. And then she became red pilled. She's got a channel or she used to have a channel. Everyone, she still does called red pill black. Um, and it's, it, it, but I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, these people are, Oh, it's the, the, the social justice is a cause of it. It's a catalyst for it. And it's just a reaction to it. These people are crazy. They're are there. I make, okay. You know, all of these people are responsible for their own actions. I, I'm not giving them an out all, they did yeah, this, yeah. okay. But all of these things, I see it like um, I don't know if you ever read or saw Richard the Third by uh, Shakespeare, but there's a line in it. No. Well, there's a line in it where he says, "You know, now I shall set uh, the wicked Machiavelli to school," and that's what it seems like to me. It's like these guys are saying, "Well, I'm going to show you how to be. You know, you want to be crazy? I'm going to show you how to be crazy. You want to be a censor? You want to be censorious? I'll show you how to be censorious." And they're trying to one up each other, and we're stuck. Uh... At, we're stuck in the middle. Well, it sounds like douchebag Olympics, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm not quite sure what to do with that information. Yeah, but but if no, but uh, look, at, it's it's because, and I've been railing against you know this kind of insanity. I came back from overseas in 2014, and I and I came back to this, and I was like, what the hell's going on? And I, <laughs> and 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 so I just started, but now it's like it's just been getting worse, but it's coming from more, more sides. And yeah. like, yeah. like at least, you know, there is a, a drawback from this leftist and I, you know, this progressive woke movement to this other, you know, right, far right. And some of these people aren't even far right, but they're getting lumped in with it. And it's just, yeah. you, know, you know, it's, and, and and every sorry, I'm I'm rambling. I should, like okay, our, 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 our prime minister just our prime minister just recently. And again, this is people are going to freak out at me. Um, there's a huge problem of uh, indigenous women, like First Nations uh, women, being killed, um, and it's it's goes on. It's you know it's it's, it's over decades, and something like thirty. It's over three thousand. It's somewhere between three thousand thirty five hundred. I don't have the exact number. To, but it happened over 30 years. 75% yeah. of the perpetrators are also, are indigenous men, right? Like First Nations. Right. Our prime minister called it a genocide. 
Right. He refused to call what ISIS did to the Yazidi a genocide. Now, I'm not yeah. I'm not trying to say uh, you know what happened to these women is horrific and it's horrible and it needs to be talked about, it needs to be looked into. Why was it you know why was it allowed to happen? All that. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, 3,000, 3,500 deaths over 20 or 30 years is not a genocide. Mm. You know, I, it, and if it is a genocide, then it's an auto genocide because, you know, like three quarters of the attackers and the perpetrators were from the same community. But so, these definitions are really, really important because, and the same thing's been happening with the whole far right issue, uh, uh, that when you start crying far right or genocide or using these words, when it's not, when when that's not the case, then it actually, then you have no words when those things really surface, when the far right really surfaces. And then, of course, there are some real far right movements, but there's, that's, that's being thrown around willy nilly at times, and I and I think well, when we have the real far right emerge, yeah. you're not going to have the words for it anymore. Oh no, we've we've, we've lost really everything. Good. Yeah, sorry, yeah, we we've lost a lot of words, and it's okay. Yo, know, yeah, Nazis throw around like crazy. I mean, I'm trying to remember who. Yeah. who it was someone very innocuous that was called a Nazi the other day, and I'm like. Uh, yeah. Okay, no, no, they weren't called a Nazi. It was a, the piece of the New York Times about YouTubers that can that led this guy to become far right, and they they included Philip DeFra DeFranco. Now, yeah. I don't know if you know who Philip DeFranco is. Go check him out. Yeah. He is extremely centrist. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, he is. He reports on the news, and he gives you a take on the news. And if you disagree with him, he'll. You know, he'll read back comments where people disagreed with him. He's, but, but I mean, he is so, and I don't want to say milk toast because the guy, you know, he is passionate about what he says, but he, his, his arguments are so center. And he's yeah. in the New York Times, he was on the front page and said, you know, and it included a collage of people who, you know, abetted people to becoming alt right. And I'm yeah. like, okay, well, where are we left with and it's again with all these things we don't have terms uh there was a general a canadian general and um a guy who's done a lot of work in the government for human rights and for you know looking to cases like the easy and stuff like that um you know on foreign affairs and stuff and he, they both said that you know and they got a little lambasted for it but these people are have some really good credentials they said this is you know genocide is the wrong term and, yes you know we can help i mean it's you say genocide it it you know Right away, you get people's attention. You know, it's it, it, it tugs on your heartstrings or whatever. But let's. But that's not right. That's yeah. it just that it, you know it, it has that reaction. Um, mm. It doesn't mean that you're right to do that. Like it, that, it, it feels manipulative. If anything, mm. you know, I know if I use these words, people are going to have a reaction. People mm. are going to feel really, really like. Um, you know, they're going to feel really um, pulled into this. That sounds manipulative. That sounds um, quite sinister to me. It, like, you know, rather than just talking about it factually and saying these are the facts and and whatever reaction people have, that's fine. Um, to intentionally blow things out of proportion to get a reaction sounds manipulative and counterproductive really because then in the long run like i said when we actually have you know genocides when we actually have um you know these these horrific um uh, these uh, monstrous um far-right movements um when you use those words they mean nothing now when somebody says they're far right they just go yeah Okay, who fucking isn't, you know? Yeah. Now, when somebody says genocide, well, yeah, that's happening every other day. Who cares? That's the reaction eventually that you get from people. And that's already happening. People are becoming desensitized to these issues, becoming desensitized to these, you know, these things that are happening around them. So they have actually taken that impact from that word by overusing it and using it incorrectly a lot of the time as well. Yeah, okay, there... On the same thing, there was a... I don't know if you follow Brett Weinstein or I don't know if you know who he is. Um, uh, no. Okay, he's an evolutionary biologist. Uh, a few years back at the college he was speaking at, uh, Eddie was teaching at, him and his wife were teaching there. They had this thing called the Day of Absence um, where for years uh, faculty 
students, staff, and faculty of color would leave the campus for a day to show their importance of what they brought to the community. And then in 2015 or 16, they said, no, instead of that, we want all white students and faculty to leave the campus. He opposed this because he said that's, you know, legitimately racist. Yeah. Anyways, he he he, get, he rose to fame because of that because he got in a lot of trouble. And but the other day he put out a tweet, and he caused a lot of issues. And I think it was again overblown. And maybe instead of questioning what he was trying to say, people just freaked out. But he said that you know there's an issue with identity politics, and he goes, "There's a real issue with white identity politics," which again I don't disagree with. He was you know white identity politics has led to some horrible stuff, which it has. Mm -hmm. But then he went on to say that, you know, continuously complaining about white people and calling them all racists and Nazis is going to push people to become white ethno-nationalists. Yes. Now, I agree to some extent, but it's, it's, it's like the saying the thing that, oh, well, always talking about Muslims is going to, you know, turn people into going to ISIS. Mm. Right? Like... Yes, and you know, in some ways, I agree with this. Like the, you go back to the '80s, and I, I keep going back to this because I, I remember very vividly when all the gangs were started happening in the states. You know, the, the Crips and the Bloods, especially, like they were talking about. And then there was the again, there was a rise, rise in you know uh, white supremacy and white supremacist groups and like things like the Aryan Nation, whatever. And wh how they would do it was they would go find loners and people who were looked vulnerable. And then go, you know, groom them and bring them in because that's, it, they were easy targets, right? They were already vulnerable and they needed some sort of support group and you were being offered that. Yeah. It's easy to do that off the internet. You know, we can talk about ISIS doing it. I mean, it's, it's so the thing is, it's not, I think what you, the problem there is, it's not like, it's not the average person who's going to be, well, you know what? They called me a racist. So now I'm going to like, uh, you know, tattoo a swastika to my head, become a Nazi. I don't, I don't think it's, but I think it's the weak, the weak people. Uh, yeah, again, you know, am I insulting with somebody? But the people who are vulnerable, the people who can't socialize properly, the people who, you know, are weak willed, and they <laughs> are. It's so it's easier to get at them with the internet, and it's easier to do it. So you might get a slight swell in numbers, but. Yeah. But again, like this this whole thing, like there was a way to have a conversation with him and say, okay, I'm not 100% sure what you're doing because he put mm. he put the tweet out based on a, a comment on a video he made. And it, it, again, it's this, it's, he, this guy was trying to have a conversation, but mm. because we've used, you know, racist, white supremacist, whatever, and he's saying, he's trying to do a warning. And I think it was, I think his attempt was ill-informed and, you know, badly, mm. badly executed. But he's kind of making it, he's painting it as a, a single issue. Yeah. The thing mm. is, wherever we've seen the rise of real, real fascism mm. and real, like, ethno-nationalism, um, that, uh, so I've just finished, um, uh, Yanis, yeah, I read, um, Yanis, Yanis Varoufakis, I think his name is. I can never, I don't actually even know if I'm saying it right. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book, um, he was the uh, finance minister of Greece. Um, uh, he wrote a book called Austerity, and he was talking about wherever austerity was imposed the most, um, the most aggressively, eventually, it wouldn't have just been that, but um, eventually it did lead to this strange, um, strange kind of, you know, very, very frightening nationalism. And they've actually got real, very, very, very real um, Nazis in their, in, their, um, in their government right now. Like he, he was saying, they, they're not even like neo-Nazis. There's nothing new about them. They, like they, they still... Um, idealize Hitler. They still do the 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 Nazi salute and all of that kind of thing. Um, and he was saying the reason why n in no other country there has been a rise, of course, in um, uh, like fascism and that kind of you know that kind of nationalism, but they haven't reached government is because the the austerity wasn't imposed 
at the, uh, on the same scale as it was imposed in Greece. I mean, that book's definitely worth worth a, a read. I mean, I, I recommend it to anybody who, like in Britain, that's thinking about Brexit right now. To I really, really, really strongly recommend they read that book. And I'm sure that none of the wankers that are, you know, deciding the fate of this country are actually going to read it. Because I think that most of them are barely fucking literate. But well, okay, um, I was going to say, can Boris Johnson read? Exactly, exactly. I think he can barely wipe his ass, if I'm honest. So, you know, okay, but, asking him to read is a whole other thing. But I mean, like, one of the things I was trying to get at with what like Brett Weinstein did, and like you know, Justin Trudeau said, calling it a genocide is. The yeah. conversation is now like the with the tweet with Brett Weinstein and with with Trudeau calling it a genocide. The conversation has mm. now switched from, you know, why are these women getting killed? What can we done about it? To yeah. whether or not it is a genocide. Yes. And I know I'm 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 adding to that conversation right now by bringing it up. But the reason I wanted to bring it up is these things matter because it's a deflection from what the actual issue is. That's the, true. You know. The actual issue is Indigenous women are being killed. Why are they yeah. being killed? Now oh, we're... We yeah, but now it's like, okay, do we get into a definition of genocide? It's it's like the Bill Clinton thing, you know? It def- depends on what the definition of is is. Like, give me yeah. a fucking break, you know? Like, <laughs> there are issues that are important and we need to talk about them. Can we just stop getting into the weeds about the minutia of all this nonsense? Yeah, but it's easier to have that discussion... For these these dunce that don't that like we said can probably barely fucking read, for them it's easier to have a conversation about whether this is actually genocide or not than having a conversation about well this is happening, this is real, what we're gonna do about it and how we're gonna deal with this issue. That is a very real conversation and that is a very real action. But they don't want to do that. They want to waste time on having conversations about unimportant things rather than actually doing the real work required to prevent these things from happening, to to prevent, you know, uh, violence, abuse, inequality, lack of education, all of these things. They don't want those conversations. They prove that time and again when they have these irrelevant conversations make these irrelevant statements make these you know that these ridiculous um like um statements and you know devaluing these actual things that have happened to people like genocide these uh, devaluing things like you know far-right fundamentalists um they're wasting time on doing that rather than actually thinking about how they're going to prevent these things that are actually very very real in our society and are still very much happening you know even in the uk for example i mean it's nothing uh compared to to that in some ways um um in the uk actually i can't say it's nothing because it is very very real and it's very it's a very big something in the uk uh for many years it used to be that two women a week were murdered by their intimate partners that has now risen to three women a week. And we're not having discussions about actually preventing domestic abuse. What we're having discussions around is uh, identity politics. That's very much the case. Um, and whose oppression is worse? I tell you what, put a brown woman, a black woman, a white woman in a room that are all having the shit kicked out of them by their husbands. They don't give a shit about their color they just care about being safe and away from abuse and that's it yeah and i mean it's i don't know where we're talking up like you like you know just said like you're talking about the wrong issues a conference yeah. that's about violence against women should not spend the better portion of its time defining what and what isn't a woman there is more violence against women in community x than community yeah. y let's go look at what's going on in community x but at the same time you don't forget about community y right you you no. and okay so the but like something like this or going back to the education thing like i've always said like you can't solve this like the education thing you can't solve this at the university level no you know, you can't solve this when it gets to that point because, okay, if you're going to let in marginalized people who aren't really qualified to get into university, mm. 
you're not, you're doing them all a disservice. Why not do like um, like okay in, in the states they have like community college and they have those in Canada as well. So you got accepted to whatever university, conditional that you take a year's courses at a community college to bring you up to speed, and then you go yeah. into the university. Right? It helps everyone out. Like with the violence against women. Okay, we're gonna have a shelter, but we don't want trans men coming into the shelter for battered women. And, okay. you know, the, and there has, you know, there has to be, you have to accept that. Like if you can't talk about, well, this woman who's being beaten by a man might not feel safe in a shelter where there's someone who says they're a woman, but looks completely like a man. Yeah. You know? And that's fair enough. That's She's not being a bigot. She's mm-hmm. just thinking about keeping safe. She's thinking mm-hmm. about survival. And if she has come from that situation, like survival is everything. You, you're constantly in survival mode at that point. And to call her a bigot, well, I'm sorry, it's not fucking on. Yeah, it's... And actually for me, at that point, anybody that's calling her a bigot at that point is colluding with her perpetrator, with every single perpetrator. Yeah, and then, I mean, okay, and if she, if she says something... And then like, oh, well, you're victim blaming, blaming this trans woman because, you know, she's, a, and it's like, no, she's looking out for her safety. Like you said, at that point, it's, it's a very basic primal thing. It's fight or flight, right? You know, I have to look after myself and if I, if yep. I don't, something's, you know, so, but there, there has to be certain spaces. Like there has to be, you know, for shelters or prisons. Like the thing I hear about coming out of prisons. Yeah. Yep. I'm sorry, a guy who was a rapist who then says he's now a woman and you put him in a woman's prison and he ends up raping an inmate. Like, what did you think was going to happen? No, it was going to be all songs, singing and dancing. It was going to be fine. You know, we mustn't mm. engage our brain at this point because mm. this is fantastic. Institutional, like every kind of institutional ism still exists. Institutional mm. sexism, institutional racism, institutional homophobia, all of those institutional isms still exist and institutional misogyny the big fucking whopper now come comes along this trans movement like i said misogyny and drag perfect because now they can be misogynists and hide behind the trans movement and claim this is a rights movement so we're not actually being misogynists perfect this is perfect and I mean the rights movement thing too. Like it's the, the I, I bring I'm bringing up a lot of these things because I think it's oh, they're all again interconnected. The the mm-hmm. you know Harvard did it this year where they had a separate graduation ceremony for students of color. Now they had the the regular graduation ceremonies where you know mm-hmm. you know the arts department, the science department, whatever they they would have their graduation ceremonies, but then they had a separate one just for people of color and like black lives matter has been asking for uh segregated dorm rooms i mean they're 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 asked and i again there are certain spaces where you you know there are issues that need to be discussed and you know just like if you need a space because you're women or even men or whatever you need something where you can talk and i don't want to you know i'm not talking about safe spaces and all this but where there are issues that are only about you i can understand but like these, yeah. these, you know, these spaces they're talking about, yeah. the Black Lives Matter was talking about, where they were like, no, completely segregated dorm rooms because, you know, if white people are in there, it's going to be make it dangerous for black people, or, you know, just like a, well, it's, yeah, or or like a little uh, clubhouse, you know, where they're playing pool and stuff, and that okay, that's only for black people. Like, how is that not racist? So, uh, how how are they going to feel unsafe at a celebration? So who knew that apartheid was going to become fashionable? That racial apartheid was going to become fashionable. Yeah, and it's done. You know? It's done in the name of civil rights. It's uh, ridiculous. I don't want these rights. Yeah. I don't want these rights. All I wanted, and ev- ever wanted, and still do want, is equality. Nothing more. Nothing less. Yeah, and uh, and I get, I don't have that level of contempt for pe- for for white people or for men. Yeah. that these people do that they want to segregate themselves out further and further and further and, okay, you know and, there's some there's it is a valid thing that some spaces are just for women like uh, you know toilets change rooms and things like that 
that's just a simple safety issue. But when we're being um, when we're being segregated because of our identities and identity politics, uh, politics absolutely not. And I mean, uh, by equality, I, I, and again, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Like what I what I mean by equality, and what I think you mean by equality is equal under the law, and yeah. you're, you're, you have every right to seek out any opportunity you want, and you know, exactly, and you know, but based on if you're capable, like you know, if I apply for a job as a you know whatever if i i i try out for manchester united yeah i, I should be laughed out of the stadium because you know i'm inept at that particular <laughs> at that particular t- you know i do yeah. not have a talent for that right so yeah. it's it's not like but i should have the equal right to go and at least try and that's all yeah. you know and that's the equal rights that we should all have i mean i i don't know why like i'm like i'm sick and tired of affirmative action I, I'm really sick yeah. and tired of it. Like I, I keep saying this. I don't want to get hired because I'm brown. I don't want to get a promotion because I'm brown. I want that because I'm acknowledged as the best person for the job or the best person they could find for the job. There might be someone better out there, but you know they couldn't get a hold of them or whatever. The way towards that, for me, like a few years ago, I was thinking, because I used to work, when I first, first started, like after uni immediately, um... Uh, what I what I was trying because I was working for a race equalities council and I was trying to start a campaign. Sadly, all of the race equality councils got um, they 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 were closed down in the same year that I started working there. Um, but one of the things that I was asking for was a campaign around eliminating. We have something called an equality and diversity form, and it's attached to every single. Um, uh, every single application form and it just highlights who is what why and all of this kind of you know crap and what would be nice is not needing that at all anymore people just to be look you know for someone to look at your cv and that's it this is your skills this is your capability that's it these are your merits and that's it and nothing more nothing less um so rather than affirmative action just taking that out of the the, the kind of equation entirely so you're not even judged positively or negatively on that on your your identities um, that was something that I was suggesting a few years ago sadly it never really got off the ground um, and it might be something that I come back to eventually but I feel like we need something like that now they did a they did some studies on like blind resumes um, this was more for um, the hiring more women but they mm. found, and again, this is from a couple of years ago, and I. Should, uh, but if, I, if memory serves me correct, with the exception of work in orchestras, yeah, with the blind resumes, even less women were hired. Really? Yeah. When they went straight off qualifications. Now, mm. does does this mean that there are no qualified women or? You know, and again, it depends on. I, I'd have to go back. Maybe I'll, I'll I'll find the article and I'll find the study and I'll I'll put it in the description because yeah. it, it it was only looking at specific jobs. So I mean, like, okay, let's say it's looking at the STEM fields, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so not many women get into STEM still, okay, sadly. So, yes, and but there was even less when they were doing it purely off qualification. So now, what does that tell you? Does that tell you that? These people are sexist because they they didn't know. No. Or yeah. does it tell you that maybe, okay, you're pushing women into going into a field that they might not be 100% fully qualified for. They might do great at it. I'm not, you know, like, there's no dispute of that. But if you're just looking at yeah. pure qualifications, but then they got hired for something other than the qualifications on that required for that job. And that's wrong. But it's... You know, this is again something that should be addressed earlier than when they're applying for the job. Like, you know, yeah. do you want to get women into STEM fields? Just don't wait until college, you know, and don't do silly initiatives in school where, okay, you know, we're going to let more girls into the science class because it's an elective than boys because we want more girls in science and we're going to force girls to go into there. That doesn't do anyone any good, but like, you know, maybe you need to teach. Maybe in some cases, okay, a segregated math class might help because boys learn math in one way, girls learn math in another. 
But if you want to be able to discuss that and study that, you can't freak out because, oh my God, you're making it all about a binary. You're not considering trans kids. You know, it's yeah. like, let's, you know, they're, I, and I'm not advocating for segregated classes. I, I, I think they're for the most part wrong, but maybe yeah. in some fields that is required. I guess you just have to be led by the data, don't you? What the evidence is showing us um, uh, rather than emotions and sentiments and stuff like that. If the evidence is, sh- is saying like the the girls learn better separate or whatever, mm. then maybe that's what you need to do. I did. I think I've heard something similar. I mean, I don't know nearly enough about it as I should to, to be able to comment, so I'm probably not going to say much more. But I have heard something, but I, I okay. simply can't remember what it was. When I when I brought the segregated things, I, I'm not saying I've read it anywhere. I'm not advocating for it. I'm just saying what yeah. if. And, I, yeah. and again, I'm, I, I don't like the idea of segregation because I think it's we need to learn from each other. And, you know, everyone's yeah. going to think slightly differently. And if the more questions get asked in class, the better for the students. But, you know, again, when you're going to look at this, if someone wants to study this now, this mm. topic is so toxic. Who is willing to put their reputation on the line to study this? There are a few people. Yeah. Yeah. But it, yeah. it, it, it reminds me of, uh, you know, like the GMO stuff. You know, yeah. the, the, the burning crops, like burning test fields of GMO uh, plants, and there, and then they say, well, there's no stu- research. It's like, well, you you burned all the crops. Like, what research do you want? And so, when a biologist yeah. or you know a neurobiologist or a psychologist wants to go in and study issues like this, yeah. oh my God, you're you're misogynistic, you're transphobic, you're you're whatever. And it's yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what it's PhD quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, what PhD student wants to go into that and actually maybe you know maybe we will find answers maybe we will find a better way of doing things but if we don't have the data all we're going off is pure emotion and you know like you you made me feel bad and it doesn't serve any purpose that you know we're not gonna mm-hmm. we're not gonna get anywhere if everything's based on emotion which is where we are actually right now everything mm-hmm. is based on emotion largely student emotions that they don't even know their own self really I mean like you learn a lot when you go out into the big wide world but universities at present are just they're just crashes that's all they are mommy and daddy can't be bothered to take care of their own kids so they send them off to college and you know the teachers better look after them because otherwise they're going to come after them and their jobs etc so they all they've done is created these crash like environments um and that's it you know kids aren't learning anything about the real world kids kids aren't being challenged i remember when i was at university um if I said something ridiculous, my lecturer would be like, and I said a lot of ridiculous things at, at college, um, you know, my lecturer would be like, well, where's your evidence? And if I didn't have evidence, I was made to look pretty stupid and sit back down. And actually, I value that today. I really, really value that, you know, because um, otherwise I would have gone out, and, had I not been challenged like that, I would have gone out into the big wide world and made a dick of myself. And that's exactly what students are doing now, because they're not being challenged like they used to be when we were at university, when we were at college. Yeah, And OK, I'm looking at this right now. Uh there's a school in the states and they're just interviewing these i i don't know or it's i don't know if it's the only school like this it's but it's called mm-hmm. the star academy it's in california mm-hmm. and they're one of those teachers said well you know teaching is a political activist occupation and they're what? teaching fifth graders all this nonsense now and yeah. okay i got taught as a kid you know not to be racist not to be mean but we were also taught, yep. you know, that, you know, sticks and stones can break your bones and words can, you know, never hurt you. And, yep. uh, you know, and I'm not talking, you know, yes, I realize if you're continuously berated and whatever, it does have an effect on your psyche. But yep. these kids are being indoctrinated and they're, you know, it's from K through 12. Yeah. Now, you know, okay. I have no problem teaching kids about homosexuality, trans, whatever. Okay. Yep. You can make kindergartners aware that you know there are people in the world who can do this and but it should be done carefully so as not to suggest to them that they are in any way you know you can say okay if you feel like this it's okay talk with your parents talk with your teachers whatever right you can work this out and you can make and as they grow older you can 
you know, bring more nuance to the theory and you can talk more about it. You can talk more about, you know, what, you know, it's, is it biological? Is it, you know, is it a choice? And then you, and you can bring all this thing into it. You can talk about the opposition to it. Yeah. But, you know, these, these teachers are saying they want to turn, they're not educating the kids into anything except for educating them to be activists. And that's yeah. not what school should be for. No, no, school is just about being kids. And learning, and that's it. And they are kids. That's the reality. You know, yeah. they're not activists. They're children. They're babies. They barely know themselves. Let them learn how to walk and talk, and just hold themselves for a bit before they before they go out into the big wide world. Because that they've got the rest of their lives for that. That's what the rest of their life is for. Yeah, but I mean, unfortunately, some of this stuff is coming into into real life, uh, which you know, I, I I hate that term too. Like, oh, it's only on Twitter. It's in real life. I'm like, well. You know, real life people are on Twitter, right? but yeah. uh, you know, it's. Uh, I work for a government in Canada. Uh, yeah. I saw some of this stuff coming into, like, like the diversity training and stuff like that. I, I saw some of this coming in, and again, it's all based on who is offended the most, and it's scary. I mean, yeah. we had, we had uh, all the chairs of the universities now have to be diverse. This was a couple of years back, and if you don't have proper representation in the chairs of universities then, you know, the university was going to lose funding. It's like, well, if it's the chair of the chemistry department, what does their identity or their your diverseness have anything to do with whether they're qualified or not? Uh, it doesn't. So instead of going looking for the best, you know, educator in chemistry or the best educator in you know, physics, whatever, you're going looking for the best woman or the best black yeah. person or no but it's, it's ridiculous like you're limiting your search you're, you're purposely yeah. limiting your resources by doing that but you're disadvantaging people as well yeah. people that are just qualified um and are good at what they do if their identity doesn't match you're just going to discard them that's pretty discriminatory in my opinion yeah i mean okay bbc did that and uh, I saw the ads, uh, like the the ads for the, the the jobs, and then the Canadian broadcaster CBC also did it, where they said, okay, okay you, know, you know, straight white male shouldn't shouldn't apply. And it's, really? Or, yeah. Well, you never you didn't hear that uproar about the BBC. No. What was this? When was this? Sorry. This was uh, last year, and I think they did it a couple of times where they put out positions, and they only and one was for like on air presenter, and they said they only wanted people of color. And, in, right. and, and the Canadian broadcaster did the same thing. They uh, they removed it. There was a university recently that put out a position, um, and it was like a well known university in Canada, like one of the top Canadian universities. And they said that same thing that you know they only want diverse people to apply, and yeah. uh, and, and diversity's gotten a, a. You can have a panel of all. We get, like forget just all black people, like all Jamaican people from a certain city in Jamaica, and maybe even a certain neighborhood from that city in Jamaica on a panel mm. and that panel is considered diverse whereas you could have uh, a, a Swede an Englishman, an Australian uh, someone from the United States and a South African that were all white and yeah. were you know, ob you know thought very di but that's not a diverse panel because it's all white but it, it, it doesn't need to be you know, diverse in the sense of what you think diverse would mean it just means to be diverse means okay. that it's not all white. It could be all black. Yeah. It could be all. Be, yeah. Have to be a colored person yeah. to to be on this panel, which is really offensive. Yeah. That's and, really very really offensive. And uh, okay, I'm uh, seeing something again. Like they're they're starting calling the manals now um, in science because they're saying there's, you know, the, a lot of the, the the panels on on conferences for STEM they don't have women again. You know, if you're having a conference on um, CERN, there's a, 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 a there's a, a, a physicist Maria, and I cannot pronounce her last name because it's Greek, and I just stumble all over it. But but I've heard her speak at different conferences, and she's been on stage with some brilliant men. Yeah, and she's brilliant in her own right. You know, like it, she, okay, so yeah. if you're having a conference about CERN. Mm. I have no issue like bring her on but like let's say she's doing an experiment and it's not working you know like she's working on something and she can't take time off and so you end up with a with a panel of only men who work at CERN talking about the issues at CERN 
Yeah. It's not for any misogynistic reasons. Like I'm, you know, like I said, she is. She is one of the. I don't know if she still works there. She was there, and when she was there, she was, you know, again very intelligent, well spoken, uh, explained things well, and you know they would have her on. Uh, I'm trying to think of a couple others, but to force this diversity, and I, I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with having, you know. And I shouldn't even have to say that. I shouldn't even have to have that qualifier. Though, oh, there's nothing wrong with having a one. You know, get the best goddamn people for the for the panel on the panel and the ones who are available for it. That's. And if you think that those people that that diversity doesn't exist, then open up that space for them. You know. But like, it, it, this feels really forced. It all feels really, really forced, and di- then hence disingenuous. You know. Yeah, to to this to me this reminds me of okay like you look at the Middle East and you look at especially you know post war the post colonial mm-hmm. stuff yeah. when all these dictators started getting you know benevolent dictators started getting imposed in the name mm-hmm. of secularism so you had this forced secularism now the word secularism in the Middle East is poisoned because of the Husseins and the Qaddafis and the Shahs and the yeah. Mubaraks yeah. you know all all these people yeah you're Again, you're going to make diversity a, a bad word. You're going to make, yeah. you know, and I I freak out about, I freak out. I mean, I, I think it's stupid that we have, you know, in Canada, diversity is our strength. No, not in no. the way you mean it. Like it's, it's this change of definition of terms and diversity now means this. There's, yeah. you know, racism is, is prejudice plus power. It's like, no, it's not. Racism is just prejudice, you know, based yeah. on race. It's, it's. I, I don't know. Like we we went a little bit uh, way off what you wanted to talk about, <laughs> but no. But it's I think it's all you know. It's all linked together, and it's just mm. I, I keep I keep saying it, and I'm going to be a broken record. But it's frustrating as all hell, and it's hard to get a standing point. It's 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 hard to get any kind of purchase on any kind of idea. When when there's so much chaos going on, I guess we we all start feeling a bit chaotic, though, don't we? Because like now, where rather than focusing on just leveling the playing field for everybody and creating real um, equality amongst everybody, Mm. when we're focusing on specific identities and, you know, all of these, um, all of these, um, these oppression Olympics are going on and identity politics are going on. It just breeds chaos. That's all it's done. Um, So we're all, we are all feeling the brunt of that, I think, a bit. But, um, Anyways, I've had you on here for a couple hours, so yeah. I mean, I, look, I'm I'm happy to go keep going, but I figure you, know, you probably have stuff to do. Uh, yeah, I do. So if you have any last words, uh, again, if there's anything you're working on, I know you're speaking in August uh, at one point, but I don't know anything else. Yeah, so we have um, actually next month we have our big um, uh, LGBT conference in response to. Uh, all of this debacle in Man- uh, in Birmingham with um, these primary schools, and there's also a Manchester school that uh, it's been happening at too. So um, yeah, please do come along to that. We're still fundraising as well. We're constantly fundraising, so um, yeah, please do um, do come along if you can. If you're in the area, it'd be lovely to have you at our conference. Right. Well, thank you again for coming on and thank you everyone for listening. (laughs)